waiting for people to join or shall we shall we start we can start once you okay. once so you are done everyone, with the music everyone yes, it's, yeah. yeah okay well good afternoon everybody um, thank you stefan yeah for joining us today and thank you also for everyone that is here so just before we start i just wanted to share a little bit of the reason that we are here today. Um, I'm Bia from Scuola Schumacher Brazil, and I'm here with Luiz and Rita, who are also part of the collective that sustains um, Scuola. And we have also a few guests with us in the conversation, and I'll put the screen in a way that you can see who's here. Um, so we have Maria Eugenia, Lisandra, Marcelo, Thais, Beatriz, and Luisa, who are, and Laida is just joining us, who are part of a course that we have run with Stefan called Gaia Alchemy. And we have done this course, I think, less than a month ago that we've, we had the last session. And Stefan is writing this book with the same name, Gaia Alchemy, and he he has been on this um, research uh, for, for a long time. And uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, we had a, a first session with Stefan talking about uh, Gaia theory. And then after that, Louise and I, we continued to speak to Stefan and, and he shared that he was doing this, this research and that is very alive for him. And so we, we thought, why not, why not expand this research with other people and, and run a course? And that's what we have done. Uh, and, and the course happened and, and there was this huge excitement of what came out, I think, of this experience and the process of being part of the course, which then made us open up this conversation to a wider group, let's say. So what we imagine for today is that Stefan will speak a little bit about the context of what Gaia, what Gaia Alchemy is and how does that relate to Jungian psychology and a little bit of his research, um, which is what he's been writing about. And then the idea is that everyone that is here with us in the room now, in the Zoom room, that have been part of this experience with Stefan, that we also share a little bit of our experience and the reflections that we have, we have had or we have today, whatever is alive. And then I'll be following the conversation on YouTube and I'll be bringing also by the end of the session a few questions that, that can come up um, from people that are watching us. So I guess that's it. One last thing, we have, uh, we're, we have, we're offering a few sessions uh, through Escola that are open to the public and it's, it's free, but we also open the possibility for people to donate if they can and if they want to donate to help us sustain these spaces for Scholar. So I'll be sharing also the link for the vaquinha, <laughs> not to use this word in the middle of the English, this word vaquinha. Um, and I'll be sharing that on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And then whoever feels like um, supporting us, they'll be hugely uh, appreciated. Um, I guess that's it. I'll pass the word to Stefan and we can continue this conversation. Okay, thank you very much, Bia, thank you. Um, yes, I'm glad we could all be together again, those of us who did the course and everyone who's joining us. Really nice to be together again. So we'll just start with a little bit of music. Which comes from India. Very nice music to begin 
the sort of exploration we're going to be doing. Okay, thanks everyone. So <clears throat> I've got a few slides to show you. So let's see if we can I can share my screen. Um, here we are. Okay, can you see that everyone? Is that right, Bia? Yes, that's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know this this um, um, dialchemy. This is uh, an azoth. It's a star, uh, an alchemical image called the azoth which in the course we were actually making on the ground. Um, and this, this is the, one of the key symbols or alchemical symbols that we can use uh, in order to find our way into the living body of Gaia, into a, a real lived experience of Gaia. And we do that by combining this alchemical image with the science that we know about Gaia now, the chemistry, biology, etc. That's basically what Gaia alchemy is. It's a kind of exploration of what, what happens to oneself if one starts to really try to unify these opposites that seem to be completely irreconcilable. And what, what seems to happen is that the world comes alive. That's the astonishing thing. Nature comes alive in a very interesting way. And um, we're building here on the work of Carl Gustav Jung, who was I mean, so extraordinary. It's, it's very hard to describe how special he was and how much he gave us. And, uh, we need to really try to understand him quite deeply. And then his, his student and co-worker, Marie-Louise von, Fra Marie von Franz. Now, of course, they were working in the realm of the psyche. You know, what is the psyche? Um, and to cut a long story short, Jung um, discovered that alchemy was actually a form of his own psychology. Um, and this came as a shock to him because he thought, like everybody else, that alchemy was a complete load of rubbish. But he, he had several dreams which pointed him in the direction of alchemy and kind of suggested that alchemy is going to be very important in his work and his life and his contribution. And that's exactly how it turned out. Um, all sorts of synchronicities happened and he, he became one of the greatest scholars or more than scholars decoders of alchemy, um, decoding of the sacred through alchemy alchemy for us. And Marie-Louis von Franz followed in his footsteps and worked with him um, and really contributed very important things as well. And basically, this is just a very rough map of what, what we know about consciousness. You know, there's our consciousness up here with our ego, our, our four functions, our thinking, our feeling, our sensing, our intuition, our everyday consciousness of ourselves. Then there's a whole air, a layer further down called the personal unconscious of things we're not conscious about, about ourselves personally. Um, and these then link directly into even a, an even, an even, even deeper level of the unconscious, the collective unconscious, where these archetypal energies live, the archetypes which seem to have a very powerful autonomous being of their own. They speak through the personal unconscious and break into ego. And the idea in alchemy uh, is of course to balance all this um, so that one can have an experience, I don't know what to call it, of the sacred, I suppose. And this is the same image we mentioned earlier, the Azoth, uh, the one you saw on the ground. But now um, this is the original image. Um, from 1659, as you can see. This is one of the key images of alchemy. Um, so what we're saying in terms of alchemy, in terms of psychology, is that if we contemplate this image, 
we take it really seriously. We don't just think, oh, this is a load of medieval Renaissance rubbish, you know, and primitive type. No, no, we're going to take this very seriously. We're going to work under the assumption that there's something very valuable here for us personally, for everybody. So we start working with the we start, we start working with all the different aspects of the symbol, and there's a lot we can do about that. We haven't got time for that now. Just for the moment, notice how there are these seven stars. And you see, I'm sorry about that Mickey Mouse hand. It doesn't look very good, really. It's a bit disrespectful to the Azov. Anyway, so this, you see, we're just going to focus on these seven rays. Not stars, sorry, seven rays of the Azov. The rest of it will have to wait for later. So this, these are the seven key transformations that everything in nature goes through. Okay, that's this, that's what we're learning here. And, and the important thing to take on board here is that we didn't invent this, this scheme. This was given to us by what you would call the unconscious. In other words, that scheme has come from down here where the source, the sacred source of everything that resides, the sacred energy that created everything, gave us this. So this is in a way the sacred speaking to us in a way that we can work with and understand so that we can come to understand the sacred more. And what we need to do now is do that in relation to Gaia. The sacred is Gaia and that's where the science comes in. Anyway, these seven processes then, um, calcination, that's burning, and reducing to a white ash. Okay, so um, um, the planet is a planet associated with its Saturn, and the metal is lead. Can you see we're, we're speaking of a sort of quality, sort of quality of a process, burning heat, making into ash, both psychologically and also in the earth, in Gaia. This is Gaia alchemy, so we're unifying the science with the psychology. My calcination is my own difficult emotions that I have to control and things like that, a complicated thing to describe. In Gaia, what's calcination? Well, we'll see. I mean, it, you can think of volcanoes in kind of, kind of calcination. Then there's dissolution. Dissolution inv involves water dissolving. You dissolve that white ash and it relaxes and dissolves. In myself, in Gaia, where is the dissolution? Where are they both together? Then there's a separation um, where things that uh, have been dissolved, start to separate, and they begin to see each other and recognize each other. And we can see that as an inner process and also as a Gaian process from science. And this is now conjunction when um, these things that have been separated and now see each other come together in a very creative way, in a very new way. And this leads to the next ray, the fifth ray, the ray of fermentation, um, where you you, the, what's been discovered, these new ways of being, these new possibilities in life that previous, previously were unimaginable have been discovered, and now they're refined. That some of it rots down, the earlier stuff rots down, there's a new spirit that comes out of that, and that's fermentation. And then the next one is distillation, where there's even more refinement and more um, exploration of possibilities, of in, innovative exploration of possibilities. Mm in a very refined, very sophisticated way. And finally, we come to coagulation. Now, this one is, is very interesting um, to me because I think this one has to do with consciousness. I think coagulation involves us. I mean, we are deeply involved in all this as human beings. You know, we're not outside it. So I think perhaps we realize our role in this when we come here to coagulation. And then I have an experience of coagulating Gaia or coagulating into Gaia, or coagulation within Gaia. It's very hard to describe it, but I think we, we, we're coming to this experience more and more, those of us who are working like this, and that is that um, the world becomes more alive. Everything becomes more meaningful and alive. Every plant, every bird, every flower, every cloud, every star in the sky, all becomes deeply meaningful and, you, and full of sacredness. And you just want to devote yourself to that so much. And then you go around it again. And even that view that you've just had there, of that view of the divine has to be burnt up and sacrificed, not, yeah, burnt to ash, just like as happens on the planet. And we go around this way, refining ourselves, but also if we bring the science into this now, feed the science into this, 
Where can we see the same process in the science, in Gaia herself? Then something very, it, it, the world becomes even more alive. You, you start feeling a very indigenous sort of feeling. So this is just the, the summary of those, those seven processes. Calcination, fire, burning, dissolution, letting go, water. These are the planets associated with each one. So dissolution is Jupiter. Separation is Mars, identifying essences, air, you know, things separating. Conjunction, feeling, thinking, earthiness, the sun. Fermentation, inspiration, Venus. Distillation, planetary life moves to a vision of truth, Mercury, coagulation, a rediscovery of Gaia as the Garden of Eden, that's to say, a true paradise, as she was before Western culture disturbed her. Um, okay, so um, what we just to finish, what we're going to do now is apply these seven processes to Gaia. We've more or less been applying them to ourselves. Now let's apply them to Gaia but bearing ourselves, bring ourselves into the relationship. We're not leaving ourselves. We're now bringing ourselves to see where are these seven processes in the history of Gaia. This is the timeline of Gaia. She's, she was born about 4.6 billion years ago. And then she's been evolving and developing with her biosphere ever since. I mean, for 4.6 billion, 4,600 million years or so. So we're going to follow how these seven processes have, uh, can be found in this uh, amazing history of our planet. And we'll see how it relates to ourselves. This is just the same, the same human arm uh, with geological time along here, just to show you how recent we are, you know. For most of the time, we only had single cells way back, and we're so recent. So it's worth bearing in mind how recent we are. Okay, let's see, where's calcination then um, in Gaia? Well, the obvious place is here. Uh, when Gaia was first formed. This, by the way, is not the sun, that's the moon. That's the moon. Soon after there was an impact with the molten Earth between two molten planets. Mm. In fact, this could be before the moon was formed. This could be Thea coming into crash with the Earth to form what later became Gaia, the Earth, and the moon. But can you see this is calcination, isn't it? The very hot, very fiery meteorites coming in, lightning. There's some serious burning up going on here. Calcination, there's another picture of it. And then of course, today that's still going on. Here's, here's plate tectonics. Here's a, a, a great slab of oceanic rock being pushed by uh, upwelling magma from deep down over here and being pushed down. And look, that rock is melting, just like the early earth. It's a kind of rediscovery of the early earth and it comes up releases carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, which is incredibly important. That's helping to regulate the Earth's temperature, Gaia's temperature, and making new rock. And there's calcination going on there. There's calcination when we have extinctions. This is um, the last 540 million years until now. And the width of this band is the number of species or families of organisms that we've had on the planet. And you can see there are these major decreases in the number of families because of mass extinctions. That's a kind of calcination, you know, when you lose so much of your biosphere, that's a kind of calcination. But every time so far, there's been a recovery. Dissolution, well, that's when the rain first started. This is the early Earth again. But now you see we have a solid crust. It's cooled enough to make a solid crust. And can you see all these pools of water? The water, we think, partly came from five or six gigantic ice comets from the asteroid belt that crashed in to the Earth. And now it's just raining, raining, lightning, raining. Everything's dissolving. So this, this water is dissolving the rocks. The air is full of carbon dioxide. That makes a car carbonic acid. And that then falls down as rain in the rain, and it starts to dissolve the rock. You get dissolution. There's actually a dissolution of the rock from the surface of the rock, freeing all sorts of chemical beings that are going to be needed for life. Yeah, life is coming, but not just yet. Now we come to separation. Separation is when those chemical beings that have been, they're liberated from the rock and they start to, that's a separation because they're liberated and they, they're sort of separate from each other. But then of course they start to combine in different ways, um, which will one day become the living cell, the living cell. Not yet, we haven't got life yet, but we've got the molecules 
that have come out of the atmosphere, out of the crust, out of the rocks, because of the dissolution. We've got the molecules here, the atoms and the molecules that will one day organize themselves into the vast complexity of a living cell. That's because of separation. Then conjunction. Okay, you can see there's already conjunction going on right here because these different kinds of um, molecule, life precursor molecule, are already organizing themselves, one, one kind into the cell membrane, another kind into the genetic material, another kind into proteins, and they're all going to somehow come together already spontaneously. They sort of, they want, they want to conjoin with each other. They want to come together to form a living cell. But what, when the conjunction really happens is now, when, aha, uh -huh, now we should be getting an animation, but we're not getting one. When the living cell appears, this is the very first bacterium. That's a shame. It should animate and show you bacteria just doubling and doubling and reproducing and covering the screen, but it's not doing it because it's a PDF. That's why. Yeah. Okay. And this later on, there was another kind of conjunction. So the point I'm making is the, con the conjunction happens when life takes off, when life appears. And that's, that's pretty soon after the, the earth was for after Gaia was formed. That's conjunction. There's another kind of conjunction, which I can't show you because the animation isn't working is they're supposed to be a, a sort of amoeba creature, another bigger cell eating this cell, and they both live peacefully together. That's another kind of conjunction. When you, you live peacefully, you, you, you engulf another kind of cell, and instead of digesting it, you live peacefully together in what Lynn Margulis called endosymbiosis. There we are, look, you see. Here's one of the ancestral cells, and it, it eats some of these bacteria, but instead of digesting them, it leaves them there. One kind becomes the mitochondrion, which gives us our energy. Another becomes, um, this is the mitochondrion. And another one becomes the chloroplast, which can do photosynthesis. This is a, can you feel like alchemically there's a conjunction, a, um, a coming together of things that were separate. Now they come together to form a, a new whole, a new, a new being. It's like a, alchemically, it's the, it's the union of the masculine and the feminine, or the yin and the yang, and you get this, new possibility which is the cell with the nucleus and these creatures look like this you know this is already not a bacterium but a, a, a one of these endosymbionts which is what we are all our cells are made up of this conjunction between two once separate kinds of bacteria or three kinds of separate bacteria these are just some of these early single-celled organisms and photosynthesis is an example of an unbelievably complex chemical conjunction amongst carbon atoms, nitrogen atoms, sulfur atoms, etc., into the vast complexity of, photosyn of the photosynthetic process. I mean, inside each chloroplast, look at this complexity. This is one little chloroplast. This used to be a once three living bacterium. And now it's, it's become so specialized, it's become a powerhouse. It even looks like a powerhouse. Lots of stacks of chemicals full of light trapping abilities that can capture the energy of the sun, the photons from the sun, and use it to split water to make oxygen and combine with carbon and hydrogen to make carbohydrates. Here's, here's the complexity. Look at this is conjunction. Look at this. This is one of the huge molecules. I mean, millions and millions of atoms in it that undertake photosynthesis. But the strange thing is, if you go right into the center of this photosystem, as it's called, photosystem two, I think it is, you go right into the center and you find a molecule that looks like this. So this is a carbon, every junction has a carbon atom. So it's like an outstretched wings. And it just struck me how, how similar to an alchemical symbol that is of the rebus. Now, you might say, oh, come on, you're going a little crazy here. I mean, it's just a coincidence. Well, yes, maybe it's just a coincidence. There's certainly no, no causal relationship between the two. But what I mean is if you start contemplating the two of them together, it's quite interesting, you know, something interesting happens. You start seeing photosynthesis in a different way. Mm. It's hard to describe. There's something full of meaning, I suppose. Fermentation. Well, this is when, of course, you start getting ecology going on Gaia, when all the organisms start forming feedback loops and complex loops of relationship like this. Um, and there's several things literally fermenting, you know, dead things fall into ocean sediments, go into the bottoms of lakes, and they form mud, 
and then bacteria come into the mud and start digesting the mud and releasing methane and carbon dioxide. That's that's literal fermentation. But then the whole thing is fermenting itself. The whole system, the whole of Gaia is fermenting by creating more and more feedback loops amongst all these beings and all these rocks, atmosphere, water, and life, all interacting through feedbacks. And of course, we get self-regulation emerging um, from all of this as well. So self-regulation of uh, the planetary level on the scientific level emerges from all this fermentation that's going on amongst all the microbes. That you, they have to swap gases. This is what Lovelock realized, you know, that life takes CO2 out of the atmosphere and in our case puts oxygen back and the whole thing becomes uh, suitable for life. But it's also regulated. The oxygen concentration is regulated by this feedback process, which is a kind of fermentation. Then we come to distillation. Well, now we just think ecosystems, once they formed, or ecological communities, once they formed, they get better at being ecological communities. Um, there's natural selection amongst ecological communities. The ones that don't recycle so well, or the ones that don't um, deal with predators so well or diseases so well, they sort of die out. Others that make good relationships amongst the species and amongst the rocks, the atmosphere and the water of the place, those ones um, make new relationships which help them through these difficulties and they survive better. Um, and, and so we get a situation like this. This is from a scientific paper, so forgive me, don't worry about this side. This side is the important thing. So this is time going up here. Each of these is an, eco an ecological community whose number of species are gradually going down because of you know, um, health, health problems in the system. Every time there's a star, however, there's a new innovation, a new feedback, a new exchange of information happens, and the ecosystem finds a new way to live, and it continues. And then this one dies out as well. But can you see that the, this one here has had three moments of inspiration, if you like, three moments of improving the relationships, improving the functioning of the system. And it just continues and gets stronger. Whereas all these others fizzle out and we're left with only one viable ecological community. Um, now this is revolutionary in science because this is for the first time mainstream scientists are realizing that natural selection can operate at the level of ecological communities. And that, uh, from a scientific point of view, immediately brings you into considering Gaia seriously. Because one of the problems with Gaia theory for scientists was that selfish individuals couldn't possibly lead to global level health of the planet. Finally, coagulation. Well, this is a painting by Hundert Wasser, one of my favorite paintings. As, as I was mentioning before, I think uh, coagulation brings us humans into the picture for me. Up till now, it can be a sort of abstract, almost abstract consideration, you know. But now I'm brought into the picture with coagulation because by contemplating all of this that we've been doing, you know, up till now, um, contemplating the Azov both in a Gaian way and in a psychological and chemical way together as much as we can all the way, I finally can have these moments of coagulation where well, it's, these are difficult moments to describe. It's when you feel the sacredness of the earth and you know it and you know the sacred source of things and you know it and you know that you must, we must reconnect with that in our culture or else we won't have a culture. Any culture that can't reconnect with the sacred in a healthy, wholesome, fearsome, fearful way doesn't have a future. It can't persist for very long. Think of ancient Chinese culture or ancient Indian cultures. It persisted for thousands of years. They were there in a very sophisticated way long before Western culture got going because they had a real sense of the sacred. They cultivated, they knew it. So finally, we can live a guy alchemical life. This is one of Hundawasa's actual villages that had been made somewhere in Austria, I think. You know, we can live ecologically with great imagination like this. This is living alchemically. Everyone in their own individual house, their own individual way of being. And 
but yet still in community with nature around us, beautiful fields to grow our food and roof gardens. I mean, we can live a beautiful life and a Gaia chemical life, which would be good for us, good for Gaia. And we end up, well, this is just an alchemical symbol, you know, we end up understanding the consciousness of Gaia like a child, having gone through various processes and connected the opposites within ourselves. And this is just to finish, this is Jung's mandala of wholeness, which he um, wrote and painted in his red book, an expression really of um, this state of uh, returning to the source of, of life and returning to a real lived sense of nature as alive and full of meaning. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to say there. So I'll stop sharing. Um, right. So anyone, please, from the course, please, um, please come in. I'm sorry I spoke. I, I don't usually do that. I don't usually just speak. Blah, 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 blah. I usually stop and have some questions. But anyway, I was gripped by the flow of the thing. So anyone, please, would you like to say anything you like? about what we've just been seeing. Yeah, or about, no, about your experience of the Azov. That's the best thing. Could you say something about your own experience with, on the, you know, with working with the Azov, making Azov, being together on the course, since the course? What I just offered was, you know, just background stuff. It's more interesting to hear what's been what going with, on with you since we last met. Um, how is it, what's been happening? And how does it relate to what I said? That's better. That's the way to do it. Okay. So if, if no one speaks, I'm going to choose somebody, okay? <laughs> and I wonder, because uh, I remember in the first sessions of the course, I think it, we went through something similar to maybe what people are listening now went through, because it's, whoa, it's a new world, a new language, a new repertoire of images so it would be really nice to listen from from the participants who went through their listens got in touch with this uh co content knowledge for the first time how, how how it was as you said to start connect to it and bring it to their own experience and how it relates to Gaia and to this more integrated sense of being Gaia so just to complement the invitation for the participants to share Great, Lou. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, I always, I am oh, always no, happy right. to start. Very good. <laughs> oh, please, please. And it was just a delight to see that you mentioned Hundert Vasa because I based all my project in Hundert Vasa in his uh, five skins, <laughs> and I've just changed the last skin, which he names uh, Earth, to Gaia because of our course. Oh, so wow. I'm reformulating oh. everything because of the course, because I now speak from this intimacy that I did not had when I started um, uh, with my projects and my ideas. So I think um, alchemy and also linked to, to Jung and to the psyche and, 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 and even the science, because I now think that science has, I do not know if it was dormant in me, the science, if um, poetry was dormant in me, but somehow I, I already feel more free to speak, which is uh, I'm bringing in my inner voice uh, connected to Gaia, to, to the projects I'm working with. And so I think this, this is so unique and, and fast <laughs> that happened, I think, because of the course. And, and through this whole understanding of, of all of these um, operations of, of alchemy, because now you see the patterns in, I, how can I say, in the manifestations of life here and there, in, in groups, in nature, so it's better to, to follow the patterns and to have a more systemic uh, view thinking on the way things uh, unfold. So it, for me, it's been really 
wow amazing i'm 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 completely in love which i think it's the best feeling to <laughs> to be and experience uh, gaia and to be with gaia and and speak through itself because i think it's there's a song in itself and and to be in this state and cultivate this state of beauty of grace i think this is what had unfolded in me and I can speak it from inside more uh, fluidly. I do not know. So it's it, it's what happening with me. Mm. Oh, that's that's really really fantastic to hear. Yeah, um, the same things happened to me. You know, I mean, <laughs> um, I felt I was making discoveries. That's the incredible thing. You feel you're making discoveries. That's really lovely. Anyway, thank you, Lissandra. I'm very, we're all very pleased to hear that. Anyone else, please, anyone else like to share your own unique experience? Okay, I'm going to choose someone. <laughs> I think that's my prerogative, isn't it? I have to choose someone. Okay, Maria Eugenia, would you like to say something? You can say no if you like. Ah. <laughs> uh... I can talk a little bit. Um, I think I'll pick up on what uh, Luis mentioned, which is how most people might be feeling while listening to this first presentation, that it's kind of overwhelming. And I think if we feel that for a little bit, so what's the best, I, I, I remember what I felt when I started uh, the course was, what is the best way to approach something so overwhelming? Not only in terms of how I was, was feeling, but also in terms of understanding what Gaia is really all about. And there's something that we did throughout the, uh, throughout our sessions and, and in between sessions was to actually meditate and to sit with uh, all these symbols and all these texts and all these ideas. And for me, I think that was one of the biggest um, points or the, one of the most amazing things to do during this quarantine. Because even though we're quarantined and studying alchemy and studying Gaia, we still, or I, at least myself, I still react with wanting to do something. Still in a story of kind of separation, as if it was me who's doing something and not an integrated um, kind of approach to things and to knowledge. So I think this is also what Lisandra was talking about, this intimacy. Um, but I guess for me, intimacy is still about two people or two, two points of views. And I've been still dwelling on this idea with uh, you know, all my studying on how can I really look into something from a perspective that is not of, you know, not retelling the story of separation. So how can I go through the process of the athos and fermentation and conjunction in a way that when I get to coagulation, my conscience of what I'm studying is very integrated. So I'm still kind of figuring it out in my body how I can actually uh, get to that point where the ideas spring from a place of union and not spring from a place of separation. Stefan, you're muted. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I could say something a little, uh, a little bit about that. In my experience, what it's almost as you have, to, as if you have to go into some kind of trance. Almost, uh, you enter a, a living, a, a waking dream state, or something like that. Uh, well, well, for me anyway. Or I know what's happening, but I'm also the symbols become alive, like uh, like things are in a dream. You know something like that for me that's my experience that's when it feels very rich in my case 
Mm -hmm. So let's see. Stefan, I you. have, I'm going to integrate some questions that are coming also from YouTube. And okay, please, we'll yeah. meet the conversation. So the first question from Vitoria. I'll try to translate them there in Portuguese. Okay. Uh, would you say that the natural selection process is distillation? Ah. And would, mm -hmm. so yeah. that's the first question. Would you like to answer that or would you like me to? Well, just let me, that's a very good question. It's, it, it seems to me that we can find those, those seven processes or something like those seven processes. I mean, some alchemists had 12, so there might have been 20, you know, it's, doesn't matter it's seven is a nice number to work with um that we can find those seven processes in in every single aspect of nature so if you want to say is natural selection distillation you could say maybe at times in natural selection distillation is emphasized but we'll be able to find all the seven processes in natural selection if you look at it carefully right so you'll find calcination. Well, what's that? Okay, the extinction of a species is a kind of calcination. Or maybe even a whole ecosystem disappearing. Anyway, we could go on and on, you see, like that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then her next question is, would you say that the current moment is coagulation? And she then adds that she would like to know more around the aspects that characterize coagulation and our current consciousness as human okay. beings. All right, well, the, the planet of coagulation is the moon. And the moon has to do with the unconscious, you know, with the side of ourselves that gives us all that inspiration, but which is very mysterious. It's not the rational side, which we're very familiar with, you know, with accounting and science in our culture, we're very much on the rational side. Coagulation has to do with the moon, with that more, um, it is feminine, you know, especially if you're a man, it's the more feminine side of myself that's more fluid, more relaxed, more open, more open to synchronicities, more open. That's the coagulation. And, that, and you find when you get into that state, nature becomes very beautiful. You know, the shapes of leaves and the colors of flowers and the sounds of birds, they will start speaking to you much more because you're in a coagulated state. You know, you're more in the moon. Well, you're well balanced. You've got your, your reason is going, but it's actually the moon that's the predominant, I think, you know. It's the, you could say the right hemisphere of the brain is predominating over the left hemisphere, which is how it should be. Um, so I don't know if that, that answers the, that question, does it? Yeah, keep going, ask me. Tell me if that- I'd like to right. ask, the, ask the question, another question. Or be I, I think, yeah, uh, yeah. For all of us that went through the course, the, this was very, a part of what it, we did, like, oh, is that, thing this process you know is it separation is it and i think what we learned and i learned i can say for myself is that is 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 more about is this position of interpreting and looking from outside and try to ident identify it, what it is with a classification i think the other is not much about that and more about going through the this qualitative experiences that each process uh, reveals. So coagulation is about go feeling embodiedly this quality of calcination. And I think this is something that really, really changed during our studies because uh, Stefan shared some meditations that we were imagining ourselves going through this process. Like for example, the carbon going through a volcanic eruption and going to all the carbon cycle and diff the different moments revealing more these different qualities. Then it's, it's much more about being at easy with them and, and joining this, this natural process, not as I identify in doing, but as a bit similar to what Mario Eugenia said, not so much in the self, but in a more integrative way, flowing with these different qualities and joining them and uh, so I think that's a very interesting thing about the, the alchemical side of it. It's about experiencing it in, in, a, in a whole some way, in an integrative way, not, not so much in our rational way of trying to point and rationally putting categories. So it's really a study, it's a practice that 
we went to and have to go keep going to. Yeah, that's good. I mean, for me, Lou, uh, maybe because I'm a scientist, but I had to I had to learn the various stages, you know, of processes by heart, you know, and really make myself remember them, like I do. It's like I do say with the, the steps in a biochemical reaction, right, Beatrice? You know, at the steps in a biochemical reaction, I had to learn those. I remember when I was at university. First, it's pyruvic acid, then the, the, this the molecule happens, and you know, step by step by step, I had to really work hard to do that. So I do the same with with the Azov. But then it's like playing a musical instrument, you know. I mean, with the guitar, you have to learn your where to put your fingers. It's a very hard process to learn to put your fingers. Then once you, once your body's learned that, you relax into the music. And for me, it's the same with the Azov. I had to I had to learn it, and then I relax into it. And then what happens is what you describe, you know. It's a beautiful beautiful thing, a beautiful sense of melding and belonging to Gaia. Anyone else want to say something? Uh, let's see who. Please jump in. If I may. Yes, Marcelo. Oh, yeah, Please. yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it's easier to talk after the, the colleagues have already talked, no? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I feel like I'm still feeling, and this is continuously happening. Um, after decades, no, uh, decades, uh, being teached to train intention, to train, to calculate, to train, you know, to project things. It's very difficult and hard, you know, to exercise this uh, female part of our emotions. So this experience we, we, we had the chance to exercise was something exactly to maybe in the beginning hardly trying, you know, to get in touch with our side, let's say the, the dark side we have, not meaning that this is a, a bad side, it meaning that it's a side that it's, you know, kind of not being touched, exercised. So uh, I felt that it's a continuously, you know, uh, work on trying to know yourself completely and then on also studying the process of, for example, the carbon journey, uh, the azot uh, uh, developing process. So we feel the same way how we work, how we develop. So it's a kind of uh, putting us in touch to the, the holiness that made us exist. No, something like, okay. and if with no exercise of this day by day, I feel we are very far from this understanding. So the magic of this experience is to starting thinking about all the things that surround us, all the things that made us possible to exist and also jump on, jump in and, uh, you know, make part of this holiness. Wow. Yeah. Marcelo, thank you very much. It's really lovely. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. That's what we seem to have lost in our culture is the, is the connection of holiness, sacredness. You know, people think you're mad if you talk about Stephanie, you've, you've, you've oh, muted sorry. yourself. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was just saying, it's people think in our culture, people think you're mad uh, if you say nature is sacred. But in fact, <laughs> it's mad to think nature isn't sacred. I mean, that's, that's the madness, that it's not sacred. I think, how, how can it be sacred? You're mad if you think that. And uh, that's, a, we, that's what we've got to cure very quickly. I didn't, personally, I'm not sure if we've got time to do it. But we have to try. And the first place to start is with ourselves, of course. You know. Anyway, let's see. Who else would like to say something? Um, are we doing okay? I have another question also from, question. Yeah, please. Yeah. from, from YouTube. So yeah. I'll do my best to translate this one. It's quite complicated to translate. From Camila Colato. Okay. She says, um, 
Knowing that the alchemical system uses as a base the knowledge of the seven planets, the astronomic knowledge of the seven planets, oh, yeah. having Saturn, I don't know how to say the name of the planets in English, as our temporal limit, and that, and that which limits our experience on Earth. Uh -huh. How then is the extension of the Gaia experience, considering also Uranus, Neptune and Pluto associated with the consciousness of order, of integral order uh, or collective order, integral slash collective order. Would that, and then a final, <laughs> just to add a little bit more, would that um, be a new process that Gaia initiates now on its, in, on its exploration as, as, as well as us in this tra trajectory? I see. That's interesting. See, what, what, uh, what the question is doing there is it's taking the planets symbolically. Did you notice? So they are, they're not the actual physical planets. Well, they are, but we're speaking of them symbolically. That's interesting. So in other words, they're pointing to qualities in ourselves and in probably in the universe when we, when we say Uranus and Neptune, Pluto, you know, and are, the, are, are these qualities that we need to discover? Well, maybe. I mean, I don't know. You know, that's a, it's an inch. But the point is, that's a good way to think about it. When you think about it like that, um, you're already you're already in a living cosmos. The cosmos is, is already something full of meaning. Well, it could be wrong. Right? How, how can we know it's wrong? I don't know. I don't think it's wrong. I think it's right in some way. Um, but it's right in the terms of the unconscious, not, not the terms of, of the rational mind. Um, it's right in terms of Gaia, of the, of the reality of Gaia, which is not entirely rational. That's all I can say. I mean, I haven't really pondered those three outer planets very much at all. But I like the way of thinking. And if we can combine that way of thinking with the science, so we know how far away those three planets are. We know what rocks they're made out of. We know something maybe about how they were formed. That already enriches um, the archetypal dimension of those planets. You know, we need to bring these two things together. Um, so anyway, that's, yeah, I hope that's all right. Uh, anybody else, please go ahead. Uh, about your experience. Thais, would you like to say something? Uh, hi, Stefan. So, yeah, uh, my colleagues uh, told a lot of things that I'm feeling also, um, but maybe I, go, I would like to add that I'm a sensitive person, and for me it was really interesting to integrate uh, things that I didn't know that was I was feeling, and dreams, that the, our dreams is really are really important. Uh, for us, and not just in the course, but in the course, they became more alive. I think we we start to process all all these um, feelings of uh, process of Gaia in in our unconscious, and it comes in our dreams. And for me, it was really interesting to see uh, that this thing that I'm read, like feeling about nature is sacred, and all this thing that I had I had it before. Uh, putting science inside that and could really feel these feelings that I, re I already had in the cycles, in the science, uh, in the formation of the earth and can, can understand better this, this dreams, can understand better what, what you're processing now in these times, like our, our colleagues said, nothing is really separated. So, so it is a continuous experience. So it continues expanding once you start to look for it and practice it. Uh, you come in your life um, with personal experience that you can relate with this dissolve and the formation of Earth, and it can can maybe make easier or i don't know if easier but it can you give you a different vision about things and and then you can be feel like a part uh, but a part of a, a really whole a whole not not just a part a part of things but integrating a whole that's doing uh an important process 
Uh, and yeah, I just want to tell you also, Stephanie, my work that I'm, I work with education, environmental education. I was uh, talking another day with my, my work colleagues doing an interview with a scientist that work with um, climate change. And he was, talk was talking about sargassum, that is that kind of algae that uh, the process that's forming that these things are coming from the forestation is everything integrated and also uh, it was now it's an innovation in this research that these algae also can capture a lot of, of co2 from the atmosphere so it's every uh, again so these guys are saying how you can see how the earth is really regulating itself because the same thing that's like causing this August coming to the sea, the sea August sea sargassum phenomenon, uh, are, is also uh, capturing the CO2 and balancing again the system. So all these things, when you see and you inside that, is really amazing. So you, yeah, I, I think it's a continued experience. Really, thank you. <laughs> oh, that's really good. Yeah. Yeah, it's good that you started feeling carbon dioxide going in and out, you know, of the algae like that. That's that's a real guy and feeling. Yeah, that's really great. Really good. Stefan, uh, I have another question. Oh, yeah, another question. Go ahead. Um, is there an analogy between the seven rays and our moods processes along the day? Oh, yeah, I think so. I think, I mean, <laughs> I know from myself, I go through all those seven uh, all the time you know the question is whether i'm aware of it or not a lot of the time i'm not aware but when i stop and i think hold up hmm, that's interesting you know i had that particular mood just the other day hmm, or just this morning ah yeah you know if i if i think of that as a calcination yeah you know what that helps me get out of it and get into dissolution and then go you know, into distant and coagulation, which is when you become aware. Oh, uh, and then the, when you get to that point, I mean, it doesn't happen with me very often, but then suddenly the coagulation expands and you realize that you're in the middle of nature and you, you can actually see the trees and you can see the clouds. You actually realize that they're not a backdrop, they're actually the center of things, you know. I mean, I think that that would be the ideal way for me one day to be able to to work with gar alchemy i can't I'm not say i can do it now but i can imagine how it would be you know if i could say have a bad mood a uh, calcination oh i see that and then move around and then recoagulate um you know that, i think that's what it's like i imagine <laughs> all my fantasy of how i would like to be but i'm nowhere near it of course so anyway um let's see who have beatrice as a scientist can you tell us something um, about your experience. Hi, Stefan. <laughs> Hi, oh. all. I think my experience was quite similar to Marcelo, actually. I think we have a very similar process. But what I felt more in me was the need to connect to myself because I was always thinking about the outer picture and about Gaia and about the processes and I was forgetting that I'm still a part of it and uh -huh. by the end of the of the course I, I found out that I spent all of our weeks talking and speaking to the people and saying that I can't feel these things that you all feel <laughs> I can't connect I can't connect and by the end I was crying <laughs> and I could not I don't know take me apart from I think the group and then I, I kind of started noticing that the changes that happened within myself with myself I think this uh, you you just spoke about oh this is a bad mood um, it's just calcination I'm going <laughs> I'm going through and it's okay and at a certain point during the course we we spoke about the azot being about movement and not exactly uh, a fixed state. And I'm still absorbing it and trying to see myself in this movement, in this constant 
process and I want to say evolution but it's it's not the word but it's like improvement <laughs> um, that I seem to be constantly in <laughs> and after the course I've been actually reading up on Jung <laughs> which is something I had not done and I think it as a scientist it's a bit opposite to what the other people did because I knew a lot about the science that we were talking about. I knew nothing about the people and about the feelings, <laughs> about the things that we could use to connect with the science. I used to connect with science in a very rational way. And for a while I've been trying to do it intentionally more with a certain intuition or connecting with my emotions. And I think the course helped a lot in that because I actually got to see that I had emotions <laughs> and they were manifesting in a way that I could not perceive before. But then I did. <laughs> I think that's it. Yeah, that's, you see, it's, there's something very magical about um, alchemy. There, there really is. I mean, it, it does trigger transformation, doesn't it? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a magical thing. I think once once you contact what Jung called the unconscious, you know, um, it 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 starts working. It starts trying to heal you. That's not to say it's always going to be a pleasant experience. You know, there are times when it's not, yeah, you know, really not very pleasant, but but somehow it heals you. It's the amazing thing about the Azov. It's got its own life. It's its own. It's got a psyche in it. Thank you, Beatrice. That's great. Now. Let's see, um, Carolina, would you like to say something? Yeah, I was just about to to <laughs> to ask for it yeah. because my my experience in some ways was uh, the opposite of Bia's experience uh -huh. because I was that that child that felt fr frustrated in science class and math and physics because I couldn't understand it like it it. It didn't make any sense to me. So in our first class, I felt frustrated because it was like, I won't be able to understand the science part of it. Oh my God, what am I doing here? This course isn't for me and all of that. Um, and then uh, we split, split into groups, into uh, groups of two. And I think I was with Bia. So it was one person really into the emotional part and one person really into the scientific part. And it was the perfect match, like right in the first class. And uh, then I, I realized there's, there's some magic going on here because she was able to help me with the science part and I was able to help her with the more subjective part. And from then, um, um i realized i started realizing that i can feel science it's not about understanding from your brain but it's logical in the sense that it's here it's everywhere so when i'm planting now i can relate to science because it's it's practical it's like every day and the things I touch and also in the things I feel. So it was, it was like a shift for me and uh, making peace with this whole other part in me that I thought was stupid, that I was stupid, that I was dumb, that I didn't have that intelligence. But actually I do have, but it's another path to enter it. So the course really helped me in so many things, like every everything you just said and understanding me, but I, I wanted to bring that, that it helped me to understand science, start understanding science um, through another perspective, not the rational part of it, but the emotional part of it. That's how I learn. I learn from my emotions. So for me, there's, it, it's, it has everything to do with uh, Gaia being one with us. So I, 
I, I can stop being at war with myself. And then I can stop being at war with other humans and with, with the earth. So the way the course happened, and it wasn't like you, Stefan, giving us a lecture, but you in a really humble way, helping us to understand what was going inside of us. So it was really beautiful. For me, it was really a paradigm shift in the way I learn and the way I see the world. And um, things are more beautiful now. So yeah, I'm really thankful. Oh, thank you, Carolina. That's, yeah. I think you've shown, <clears throat> you've experienced the integration of thinking and feeling by the sound of it. And you've experienced it. You know, it hasn't been an intellectual thing you read about in a book. It's happened to you as a lived experience. You know, more wholeness. That's amazing. Really fantastic. You know, it makes me think this, this whole thing with alchemy and, um, you know, the psyche is such, such a living thing. Wow. So alive. Aha. Uh -huh. So let's see. Um, a lot of people before you choose the next one. Oh, yeah, sorry. Go on. <laughs> a lot of people on YouTube are also, and it made me think what Carol just shared on the the need to bring this kind of of learning to schools in all over the world on integrating it as part. Because what Carolina shares is just incredible to think that how can you start teaching someone if it's not from the experience right how can you start from which is actually the way most of us have learned everything that we know but mm -hmm. so a lot of the conversations here on youtube have been on how wonderful it would be to bring this kind of education to schools well there are some schools that do it like montessori schools steiner schools but not mainstream schools but of course it would be children are naturally here there already I mean, can you remember? I remember when I was a child, I was completely Gaian. Ooh. We all are. We're born Gaians. It's just that our culture beats it out of us. Or, well, it doesn't. No, it doesn't do that. It pushes it into the unconscious. The good thing is it's, it's always there. We just have to uncover it. That's all. It doesn't push it out. It just pushes it away. There's no, in the psyche, there's no out. It's all in. It's all, it's all inside. So that's good news. That means we can find it again. Uh, Lida, would you like to say something? <laughs> um, say no uh, to yeah, go on. I, I'm, I feel like I'm more like a listener in this course because I ended up like going through a lot of um, difficult things during the time of the course. I had to move houses twice so I couldn't like give like the best um of me to the course I guess like I really would like to have to be more focused on everything but I guess like the most the most important for me was like really because I was like doing the course and like had having to move houses at the same time so I really uh, reflected about what house means, like what, what home means. And I guess I could like really, like listening to all of you, I could really relate to, to like Gaia as home. So like when, we, when I think about my house and home in the, in the microcosmos and then Gaia as the, the bigger one, uh, how important it is like to, to listen and to do a course like that and to to exchange out what we did and to really realize Gaia as home and how we are taking care of it and how we take care of our homes of like inside of us, of our bodies and our minds and everything and our inner universe. That what is what one of the things that we really uh, connected in the course and how we are like relating with Gaia in the, in the the bigger way like how we are taking care of it how we are what we are doing with it like as human beings as as persons that are inhabiting it so i think the most important for me of like doing this course during this time of my life which was like which was and it's really it's still being like really challenging was really that like to to think about gaia as home and 
how am I relating with that and how we are everyone relating with that and how we can do it better. So yeah, it was really, really great, really beautiful. Oh, thank you, Lyra. I mean, I'll just say the obvious thing, you know, the word ecology uh, has oikos, you know, the first part of it, which means home. You know that, of course, but ecology is the, or rather Arnie Ness, he had a better term, he had the ecosophy, wisdom of the home. Ecos, home, Sophia, wisdom. So I think that's what you're, you were cultivating, wisdom of the home. You are getting a sense of the wisdom of the home, the wisdom of the human home and the wisdom of our planetary home. That's Gaia. So that's really nice. I think you were, you know, exactly where you were meant to be at that time. Uh, Luisa, would you like to say something? Hi, Stefan. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, Hi. What I think was, <laughs> what I think was the strongest uh, feeling and experience about this course was that before it uh, somehow uh, the notion that uh, us, like myself and, and Gaia and nature are the same thing, it was something that was, it was rational to me. And uh, after living the course and doing all the meditations with the Azots and building different Azots, being with them and doing the deep time walk, which was a very, very strong experience to me. I, I could feel it, like really feel it, that uh, I am Gaia and we, we are all the same thing. And that made me realize um, how important it is that um, in everything we do in our lives, we should, um, we should do it trying to, to contribute uh, to the process of making life more complex, like it has been uh, through Gaia's history. So in everything I do, I should do something that benefits life. And, and this was uh, very strong to me in a very rich experience and also realizing and feeling uh, time relativity. And, and this was also a gift from the course. So I think those are um, the most important experiences I had here with you. Mm, thank you. Yeah, I think the time is very, in, very important to connect with, isn't it? The depth of time, how, how ancient the Earth is, how ancient Gaia is, and what she's been through in all that time. An incredible story. Um, if Gaia were a human being, you know, you'd want to make a film about her for sure. It's such an interesting, interesting life she's had. Now let's see. Is there anyone wow, in? Wow, that's me. Rita, yes, <laughs> Only <are>. me. <laughs> Rita, yes. Oh, I, I have no, no more things to add. Uh, I love it to listen to everybody. Each one has a different experience. But uh, I, I realized that listening to you, that uh, for me, uh, I, I'm all, I'm, uh, I like science and to study science. And also I like, uh, uh, sensible approaches of uh, understanding the world. Uh, I love it to, for instance, to chemical um, sequence of photosynthesis or respiration. Or I love this. It's, it's a, something magical for me. And uh, um, but what um, I think that alchemy is something very. Uh, powerful to connect us uh, in, um, in a very sophisticated way. But for me, what happened was um, the experiences. During the, the, the experiences, I, I, I was not aware what, about what was going on in me. So you said, um, let uh, you do the azot many times with many materials, with many things put on the house. And I did that. 
And I think that what, what really happened is unconscious. Yeah. Is, is in my unconscious. I, I, I can't control and express is, it uh, pre precisely. I, I'm just uh, in the wave of uh, uh, bringing this, the things uh, uh, into consciousness, but uh, it is coming uh, sometimes when I am doing other things, when yeah. I am reading or preparing a course or taking care of the plants. So, so it's not, it's something aleatory that comes and it is very uh, full of energy. I, uh, it's like that for me, I think I can't, I, uh, I, I think that I can't, and I don't uh, want to control. It's just, uh, it happens yeah. and uh, life is like that. <laughs> yeah. You're muted, Stefan. I thought I was there. I take the as off. Thank you, Rita, that was great. I do a similar thing, I notice. I take the Azoth and I just let it go in, sink into me. You know, let's let's sink in. Give it to my unconscious. And I think the unconscious goes, oh, thank you. At last, you know, at last you're recognizing some of my symbols that I've given you to help you out. Thank you. Giving it back to me. Great. Okay. So I'll, now I can start. The unconscious starts working and it comes up. The moment of consciousness, suddenly you're watering a plant and you suddenly realize, oh, the whole of the Azov is in this plant, something like that, you know, and for me anyway. So it's very much working with the unconscious. That's right. I think it is. It's offering something to the unconscious saying, you really do exist. And thank you for giving us this beautiful image. And we're going to work with it um, as consciously as we can, but with your help. And then, then you start. It starts to change you. The unconscious responds and starts to help you change. It's a remarkable thing. Jung discovered this. Uh, anyway, so um, Stefan, I have I have a question to you. Then yes, please. Yeah. But before we before I ask you the question, I just want to say a few things um, that I really want to make sure that that people that are watching us that they hear before before they leave. Okay. So one of them is that we we have a, an app. So a, people, a few people mentioned the deep time walk. This, there's an app available that I really strongly recommend and everyone is free. So you can go to your app store or the Android store, whatever it's called. And if you look up deep time walk, then it takes you through the history of the earth. And it's quite amazing. Uh, second thing is... Yeah, so, so someone asked if we're opening, if we're running the course again. So we are planning to have a second edition of the course. We're still uh, fine tuning the dates, but we will open quite soon. And what we have done is we created a form that people that are interested in general in topics like holistic science or deep ecology, they can sign up and then we'll let you know if there's some, if something comes up this course and other uh, talks and open spaces or groups, study groups. Um, and the last thing I just want to say about the, our Vakinha again, that this is an open space and we offer it free of charge, but uh, we have the option for people that want and can support Escola Schumacher to continue to offer these kind of spaces. There's a, a Vakinha, I'll send the link again on, on YouTube. Um, and then, Stefan, maybe we can end with this question. I know we are almost running out of time. This question and a little bit of music, okay. of course. Yeah. And so the question, to, the question I wanted to ask is that the same question you've been asking everyone, because I know like this, you are in a process of a very long research in the topic of Gaia alchemy and when you decided to open up the possibility for 15 people to join you on this research, something might have shifted for you. And I wanted to hear a little bit of how it was for you to open up your research to a wide group and what changed on, on you and on your experience of exploring Gaia alchemy. Mm -hmm. Well, there's so many things to say. One thing is, I felt when I was making my Azoths on the ground, you know, in my jungle here, on the soil, on the earth, I felt everyone else doing the same in Brazil. 
and that was a that was a very lovely feeling i also felt because you know i was born in venezuela which is next door to you so i'm a latin american you know i mean we share the amazon we share some of the same indigenous people the yanomami for example so for me personally it connected me very beautifully back with latin america you know where i was born and where i which i love um and but also i just loved it feeling that that how it was working for all of us it was working it was doing it was working not just for me it was working therefore maybe the biggest thing i've taken is that there's a, there's an objective validity in the azoth in working the azoth like this with gaia and gaia alchemy there's something of objectively valid something that helps us helps us people westerners or whoever we are which is a way of helping us to, re to rediscover Gaia quite powerfully. So it gives me encouragement. We must, I must keep working with this. Although I've, I've written this book, now it's going to be published next year. It's going to be published by Bear & Co. They've accepted it for publication. Hooray! Can't believe it. Um, so I'll just keep working with it. I'm not, well, I'm, you know, of course, it's very easy for me. I'm a very lazy person, you know. It's very easy for me to just stop making my answers. I have to, but when I make myself go to my jungle and make the Azov, oh my gosh, it's just fantastic. It's a moment of remembering, isn't it? You know, I remember who Gaia is, who I am. I see myself more as an indigenous, in an indigenous way. This is almost as if the indigenous Venezuelan people of the Amazon come into me and show me how things are. It's sort of like that. You become more indigenous, more earthy. It's just lovely. I mean, everybody should have the opportunity to feel this. It's such a healthy, wonderful thing to feel when you're connected with Gaia. So that's that's it. So should we finish with some music? Oh, yes? Yes, right, you? thank you very much, Stefan. And thank you, everyone. It was really beautiful to hear you and to be with you again. Well, it's lovely. Now let me tune up a little bit here. Oh, no, so no more. OK, and then we'll. Well, we'll see what happens next with, should stay in touch about how you're doing with your Azov and your, your guy alchemy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Be thank well. you, Stefan. <laughs> and keep going with the ops WhatsApp, if you like. Let's keep sharing on the WhatsApp. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.